Good morning and thank you for joining us for our program evaluation series. Our topic for today is Title II Part A, Teacher and Principal Training and Recruitment. Uh, Becky Book and I serve as your SA, SSA consultants here in Special Revenue at the Region 10 ESC. And we are going to spend a little bit of time this morning going through uh, Title II Part A, the program evaluation series in general, statutory requirements, and a few other things. Uh, if you have not had the opportunity to register uh, or mark your attendance, this screen will be up at the very end and you'll have the opportunity to do so again at that time. So here is our agenda. As I've already mentioned, and as I've already gone through before, if you have joined us with some of our other program evaluation series, uh, we are going to go over a quick overview. We always dig into the statute, then we'll cover use of funding, some examples of what is considered allowable and what is considered unallowable when it comes to cost uh, and program funding for particularly Title II Part A. Then we'll go into the program evaluation process, the link between the CNA and the CIP, and then preview of other upcoming program evaluation series sessions. And then we always close out with a couple of resources. As we go through this, if you have any questions at all, please feel free to stop me and send a few things through the chat. And if I know we're going to cover it uh, shortly, I will acknowledge it and say, hey, we will be covering this in the next few slides. Uh, and if not, I will make sure that we cover any of the questions that you have. If you are unsure about sending some questions over the chat today, always feel free to email back your eye at, at Region 10. So the program series overview, what is it? How many are we doing and why are we offering it? Uh, this is the series description that you've already seen uh, on the flyer. So basically, to sum this up, it's saying if you're receiving federal funding, you will be evaluating the program. <laughs> you will be double checking to make sure that this program and the strategy and activities that you've invested resources in, and resources being, of course, financial resources as well as just time, uh, that is actually worthy of you doing so. And it was a worthy program or action or strategy to invest your resources in. We are offering a total of nine in this series, and we have already covered our first four. This makes the fifth one today. Uh, we started off with Title I Part A. Uh, we are covering Title II Part A today, and then we will conclude on June 1st with Title VI Part B. Also, as a reminder, these are the title sources uh, still under Nickleby, still under No Child Left Behind, uh, as we are still under that guidance until July 1 when we transition officially into the Every Student Succeeds Act or ESSA. Why are we offering this? With schedules, but we wanted to make sure that we provided a sort of on-demand assistance kind of approach to this. Uh, in the event that you have questions or a colleague has questions or you just want to go back and say, hey, I want to look at that piece again. I know they mentioned something about that allowable cost. I think it's unallowable kind of thing. Uh, we wanted to make sure that this was available for you. And it is both on our websites, usually within the same day, as soon as our tech folks scrub the video to make sure there's nothing weird going on in the background. Uh, we are typically able to post it on the website within that same day. It's also available in our online learning center. So statutory requirements. Do I actually have to engage in this, meaning the uh, an actual evaluation of the program? And we know that's a yes. Um, and where does it say that I have to engage in this and what are the pieces that I have to do? So the evaluation process just in general is basically looking at what it is that I set out to do. Did I actually accomplish what I said I wanted to accomplish? And to what degree did I accomplish it? So with evaluations, as specifically our Title II Part A, it has to be planned from the start. So this does include collecting baseline data. And this baseline data helps us and assist us in providing uh, data points to look at later to say, did we actually achieve what we wanted to achieve? And with all federal programs, the end result is student achievement. Did our students perform, I have an increase in performance, do better than what they did say this time last year, and moreover, without the activity or strategy that this program funded? If we didn't have this, would they have done just as well? 
or with the data that we've collected at the end and we're able to look at this data from the end point, which is the program evaluation part, versus when we started, was this program successful in aiding and assisting our kids? Data from this uh, can be collected from a variety of sources, of course, uh, but the first of which is in like at the bare minimum, we want to make sure we include our funding sources. So those are our budget reports, uh, your CNA, your comprehensive needs assessment, as well as your improvement plans, be they the campus improvement plans or your district improvement plans. And as you're combing through this, if you notice or you see that you don't have as much data as you would like, that's good that we are acknowledging that and we see that. And what we want to do going forward is making sure that we take measures and put things in place so that we can start uh, intentionally collecting data more often and at variable points throughout the year. And statutory requirements as pertains to uh, the actual program evaluation are indicated and found in the provisions and assurances portion of the Nickleby Consolidated Application, just as an FYI. So within Nickleby, it says, the applicant will adopt and use proper methods of administering each such program, including the enforcement of any obligations imposed by law on agencies, institutions, organizations, and other recipients responsible for carrying out each program and the correction of deficiencies in program operations that are identified through audits, monitoring, or evaluation. So yet again, it's basically saying, yes, we do have to evaluate our programs. And with that, not only evaluating it, but having a look at what deficiencies there may be, what corrections uh, were a result of the fact that we invested time in this particular uh, program or strategy or action plan. So specific to Title II Part A, uh, the statutory requirements that are there, and this is found both on agency's website as well as on our own region10.org slash Title I website and in statute from the USDE, our Title II Part A program activities will have a substantial, measurable, and positive impact on student achievement, academic achievement, and will be a part of a broader strategy to eliminate the achievement gap that separates low income and minority students from other students. So in a nutshell, that's what Title II Part A is for. Yes, um, having, uh, I mean, I had to correct myself because it's not high quality that went away as of this school year that we're in right now, as far as our teachers, we still have to have paraprofessionals, but state certified teachers, yes, that is a byproduct of this. But at the end of the day, the, the goal of Title II Part A is addressing student academic achievement and making sure we're eliminating those gaps. So with that being said, let's go straight into the law. Um, what we are getting ready to look at is part of the ESEA, that Elementary and Secondary Education Act, that was passed back in 1965 by President Johnson. Um, one of the things I wanna point out from this is that Title II, the way it looks now, there have been some slight variations in the requirements over the years. And just as under ESSA, you'll note uh, as we transition into it, that this concept of like core academic is, is now changed and replaced with you know, well-rounded education. And there are a few other tweaks here and there, but at its core, what Title II is supposed to and uh, aims to do as far as eliminating that achievement gap has been pretty much the same <laughs> since uh, President Johnson passed the Elementary, Secondary, and Education Act of 1965. So I wanna give you a little bit from the law itself. And the Title II Part A, also referred to as Teacher and Principal Training and Recruiting Fund, uh, provides supplemental funding. And that is a key piece. I like to point that out. This funding is supplemental. And yes, there is a supplement uh, versus the plant portion and, and clause, if you want to call it, in Title II. Uh, so again, this funding is supplemental to improve student achievement. The funds are used to elevate teacher and principal quality through recruitment, hiring and retention strategies, and to increase the number of state certified teachers in the classroom and highly qualified principals and assistant principals in schools. Uh, this program uses scientific based professional development interventions and holds districts and schools accountable for improvements in student academic performance. Because as we've already said, it all comes back to student academic performance. 
So going into uh, what's considered the program purpose, this I pulled straight out of statute as well. The purpose of this is to provide grants to state educational agencies, local education agencies, and state agencies for higher ed and eligible partnerships. We are doing this, or rather the USDE is providing this funding because they wanna make sure that we have an increase in student academic achievement. Um, that's just where it, uh, what it boils down to, but part of it is improving teacher and principal quality and increasing the number of state certified teachers in the classroom. And the second piece, uh, one of the second program purposes, is to hold LEAs and schools accountable for improvements in student academic achievement. Because they're saying, in short, we're providing this supplemental funding, so we want to see what you can do and what are you going to do uh, to meet the needs of our students who are not performing necessarily at the same level as others. So this is the last piece of the program funding I wanted to point out, a program purpose I wanted to point out to you. Uh, in exchange for the funding that we're receiving, we are held accountable to the public for improvements in academic achievement, and we are to provide uh, flexibility to use these funds creatively to address challenges to teacher quality. What are they concerned teacher prep and qualifications, whether we're referencing recruitment and hiring, uh, PD, retention, all of the pieces that go together are all factors as to quality of education that we are providing in the classroom to our kiddos. So I feel like I would be remiss if I don't talk about the high quality requirements um, and again acknowledge the fact that uh, highly qualified teachers went away this 16-17 uh, school year. It's not that it's gone, it's just, well, we'll go into it in a moment as we all know being that this is the end of this year. Uh, we'll also hit paraprofessional as well as referencing the requirements for what's considered high quality PD as a lot of our campuses across our region use their funding for that, for the PD purposes. So highly qualified. Uh, we know beginning the 16-17 school year, our educators in the state of Texas had to meet state requirements for certification. So that term highly qualified went away. Um, it is still important to note, of course, that all state certification requirements uh, still stay in place and we still have to uh, default to that, um, but that term highly qualified and hitting those federal uh, regulations went away with the 16-17 school year as pertains to our teachers. I wanted to also provide you uh, with a definition, and this comes directly from the law, uh, the statute, as pertains to what's considered a highly qualified paraprofessional, because the mandate for our support staff to be highly qualified still exists. So, According to statute, a highly qualified paraprofessional means uh, someone who has not less than two years of experience in the classroom and post-secondary education or demonstrated competence in a field or academic subject for which there is a significant shortage of qualified teachers. That requirement did not change. It is still the same and it is still there as we conclude the 16-17 year. This gives you a little bit more information. Uh, this is really a definition of what's considered a paraprofessional in our state. So it's an employee of a LEA who provides instructional support. These duties that are listed here, and I'm not gonna read all of these to you. I, I know we have access to this. Uh, if you wanna see the full statute again, let me know and I will forward you uh, where you can access the link on the USDE's website as well as on the agency's website. But this is just a list of a few duties that can be included uh, in paraprofessionals' uh, job descriptions. Assisting with classroom management, uh, acting as a translator, conducting parental involvement activities, and then providing instructional support services under the direct supervision of a highly qualified teacher, which I need to go back and change that, even though that is statute, it is highly certified or state certified teacher now for the 16, 17 year. But this is directly the definition that comes from the statute. We occasionally get questions um, about what are other duties that can be assigned to our paraprofessional staff. Just as an FYI, good rule of thumb, make sure it's in the job description. Um, because if it's in that job description, it gives you a little bit more of a leg uh, to stand on, I guess would be a way to say it, um, because there is always that concept of other duties as a sign, but you want to make sure that what's in that job description and what's signed off in the job description, um, it gives a pretty clear 
understanding or overview of what's considered paraprofessional duties uh, in your district and on your campus. So I'm gonna give you a couple of other requirements um, before we go into the paraprofessional determination form because we get questions on that as well. So under Nickleby, instructional duties on a Title I Part A, and this is specifically a school-wide campus, or, or those that have at least part of their salary paid for by Title I Part A on a targeted assistance campus, has to meet these requirements in order to be considered highly qualified uh, as a paraprofessional. So again, this piece kind of repeats directly from the statute, but complete at least two years of study at, at an institution of higher education, possess an associate's degree or higher, meet a rigorous standard of quality and can demonstrate through a formal state or local academic assessment, uh, basically knowledge in the instructing areas, of reading, writing, math, says here, reading, readiness, writing, readiness, and then paraprofessionals whose duties consist solely of parental involvement activities or translation services are exempt from that above qualification requirement, uh, but also be very careful um, because with the, be very careful that you're not having your paraprofessionals go across uh, duty platforms, I guess it would be a way to say it. For example, if I'm doing parent involvement activities, if that's not the only thing I'm doing, and you kind of exempted me from the other qualifications because I was hired as a parent involvement paraprofessional, but then you turn and have uh, me serving in, say, instruction in reading or, or writing or math, we, we run into challenge areas there because there are other requirements if I am serving as reading math or, or say, or writing um, instructional assistant versus someone working exclusively with parent, parent uh, involvement, parent engagement. Just as, you know, reminder. Here is the paraprofessional determination form. This is straight from the TEA's website. They haven't changed it at all uh, because the requirements are still the same. So if you want access to this, I know we have this, but if you want access to it, again, email us and we can send this to you. And it's just, again, just a way of being able to say and having proof on file that each one of the paraprofessionals that you are funding out of this um, meets the definition of what's considered highly qualified. So now I want to leave our paraprofessionals and our teachers uh, area from what's considered high quality or highly qualified paraprofessionals and state certified teachers and go into that concept of PD. This is gonna be really brief, like this is the only slide I have here for it uh, because I wanted to make sure that I took the time to address this too especially for those of us that were functioning on a Title I school-wide campus. This was part of the 10 school-wide components, that high-quality professional development. So the definition for high-quality PD means that professional development that meets the criteria contained in the definition of PD and Title IX. So here are a list of some activities, but this is not all of them. If you actually go through the statute, it, they give quite a few more. Um, but here are a couple examples. Improving and increasing teachers' knowledge of academic subjects. Uh, give teachers and principals the knowledge and skills to keep students, or to help students meet challenging state academic standards. Again, classroom management. Uh, advanced teacher understanding of effective instruction strategies that are based on scientific research. And uh, this is last one here at the bottom, are developed with extensive participation of teachers, principals, parents, and administrators. So this, uh, these are a few examples of activities that would be deemed as being um, high quality PD, which under our Title II, we can pay for that through our Title II funding. I am going to transition into program funding itself, and we're going to have a look uh, in addition to what's considered, looking at a few examples, but what will be considered allowable or unallowable under this program. Do you have any questions for me so far, uh, now that we've covered basically the, the, the statute portion of it, um, and looked at some of the definitions of what's considered highly qualified for paraprofessionals, state certification for teachers, do you have any questions up until this point?
Okay, seeing none, I am going to keep going. Uh, as an FYI, I, I'm a little sick, so you may hear a little weird noise from time to time. Just hang in there with me. I am drinking tea in the interim uh, while uh, I am going through this. So if you see me mute a couple of times or hear me stop talking, it's because I'm getting some tea. So program funding, allowable or unallowable? I did see a couple of questions that just came up. I will address them in the next couple of slides. And if you feel that you still have a question about it at the end of this, that I did not address it to your full satisfaction, uh, please ask me again once we complete this section. So program funding. Consistent with local planning requirements, there, we have to do a needs assessment. No matter what we're doing, whether it be used with uh, federal funding, if it's used with state funding, if it's local funding, because even in our Texas Education Code, it requires that we conduct a CNA, uh, we cannot get away from the needs assessment. Um, and it says here that with our Title II Part A program, uh, we have to basically base it in uh, the needs assessment. We do have the flexibility to design and implement a wide variety of activities that can promote teaching staff that is uh, state certified and able to help students achieve more. Uh, but at the end of the day, we want to make sure that what we're using this funding for is grounded and based in that CNA. And funds can also be used to provide our school leadership with knowledge and skills necessary to lead the school's efforts in increasing student academic achievement. So even though we find quite a bit that the Title II Part A funding is utilized, uh, especially in the past with getting um, teachers who may have been state certified, highly qualified, and since that doesn't count anymore, that's just with the old before the 16, 17 year, we do see a focus on training our teachers and also paraprofessionals or reducing class size with Title II funding. Uh, you can also use this uh, it's with the retention and the continuing education of our administrative leaders as well. So I'm gonna go into a couple of allowable or unallowable kind of questions. And these are kind of common questions that we get and common things that we see. Here's the first one. Can Title II Part A funds be used to pay teacher salaries? What do you think? Yes or no? Is this allowable or unallowable? As many of you know, this is considered an allowable uh, funding. You can use your funding for this. Yes, we can. Uh, this is allowable for teacher salaries. I do want to point a few things out with this, and I'm not going to read this entire thing to you because we know that we can do this. As a reminder, and I'm trying to think what, what is a nice way to say this. Okay, so yes, Title II Part A funds can be used for salaries. Uh, for the purpose and intent of reducing class size. But as a side note, going into this upcoming school year, uh, we have met quite a few times with the agencies at a variety of uh, places, um, at the ESSA Institute, uh, ACET, and not too long ago. Um, we also just came back from the federal conference as well, maybe about a week ago. We have heard the agency say several times um, that yes, reducing class size is, is an allowable use of Title II Part A funding. However, they would prefer that you not necessarily use your Title II funding for that without a strong methodology and strong documentation as to how specifically with your kiddos, your students, that was able to show a link, a direct link to increase uh, student academic achievement. So that concept of, but we've always used Title II funding to be able uh, to reduce class size. They are not wanting to see uh, that as a rationale for using your Title II Part A funding. Um, if you choose to do that, and, it's not, and they're not saying that you can't, please just be prepared to have a, a very strong methodology uh, and documentation in place that shows specifically how reduction of class size, and reduction not meaning I'm going from 22 to 20 kiddos in the class, uh, actual reduction of class size 
has benefited the population that you specifically have on that campus in your district and how the benefit includes academic achievement. I just want to put that out there, okay? A <laughs> um, couple other things I want to point out from the screen as well. It says, in addition, as reasonable and necessary, Title II Part A funds may be used to pay for substitute teachers, and then it gives you a couple of if and only ifs. Those regular classroom teachers they are replacing were hired with the Title II Part A funds to reduce class size, and uh, or if the teachers are participating in the Title II funded programs and activities that are designed to improve the quality of the teacher force. Uh, last thing here, says LEAs also must ensure that the hiring of these teachers are substitutes, supplements, and does not supplant, because again, Title II has a supplement not supplant clause, the use of local and state funds that they would otherwise be, be spending for salaries and substitutes. So key takeaway from this is you can use Title II funding for the class size reduction, but have some strong methodology and documentation in place. Okay, on to our next question. May an LEA use Title II Part A funds to provide training for paraprofessionals? What do we think, allowable or unallowable? Yes, this is allowable. Um, a couple kind of disclaimers in here, but at first, let's go over this piece. Uh, the LEA, I'm sorry, the law does allow LEAs to use these funds to provide professional development activities that improve the knowledge of teachers and principals and inappropriate cases paraprofessionals. And then it gives you a list of, you know, if it falls under one of these kind of things. Uh, one or more core academic subjects that teachers teach, and as a reminder, core academic subject is part of the Nickleby uh, language. Uh, as of July 1, when we transitioned to ESSA, it's more, the, the phrase there is a well-rounded education. Uh, the core academic subjects thing is kind of, it, 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 it's no longer the, the phrase that you'll see referenced throughout the law. Um, also, we can use this Title II funding if it's in providing effective instructional strategies, methods, and skills. We're training and addressing the needs of students with different learning styles, so uh, embedding uh, multiple uh, modalities, training and methods of improving student behavior, and then training how to understand and use data and assessments. So as a side note, something else I wanted to point out. Um, you wanna be careful that if the training or support provided to the paraprofessional uh, we want to make sure that it's consistent with the allowable activities under Title II Part A. So just thinking back to what's considered an allowable and an unallowable um, cost. So make sure that the activity that you're using this funding for to train your, your paraprofessional support staff is something that's considered allowable, that is consistent with that. So to the extent that helping the paraprofessional meets the required qualifications, it's consistent with PD goals listed. So we want to make sure that if I'm using this funding for this, it, it, it's supported through the, the overall duties and goals that we have for that PD. Um, just as an FYI, you can also use your Title I Part A funds to support ongoing training and PD uh, to assist with your teachers and paraprofessionals, as long as it's meeting the teacher and para requirements. So really provide it that you are maintaining records of the amount of the Title I and Title II Part A funds that you're using for PD, and that the Title I funds that are being used are permitted within the statute and regulations. You can completely uh, do coordination of funds here. If, to reference again, our uh, 10 school-wide components, you can coordinate funding and split the, the paying for the training between your Title I and Title II Part A funds, just as an FYI. Okay, here is the next one I have for you. Allowable or unallowable? May LEAs use Title II Part A funds to purchase supplies or instructional materials that are used as part of professional development activities?
supply purchases are allowable. Um, but it's one of those yes buts again. <laughs> Only if the expenditures, like any cost paid for with using federal funds, are again reasonable and necessary to carry out that PD activity. Uh, Title II Part A funds may be used to purchase materials and supplies used in PD activities, including the materials, like your, say your graphic calculators, that a teacher would need in order to apply the PD in a classroom setting. Okay, so here's where it kind of goes, uh, however, <laughs> Under Title II Part A, uh, it does not permit the use of the program funds to purchase materials and supplies uh, that may benefit the students if it is not directly connected to the teacher's PD. So with that example that, that's in there, such as the graphing calculators, you wanna be careful um, because under Title II Part A, you can purchase materials and supplies um, but it has to be directly connected to my, as the teacher, as the educator's PD. But there are other fundings, uh, such sources that you can use, other federal funding sources that you can use to purchase instructional materials or, or technology. So be aware of that. Uh, that again, kind of falls into that coordination of funds realm. Uh, so be aware that you can, <coughs> excuse me, you can purchase supplies for the students, of course, but it just not using your Title II Part A. So what I want to cover with you now are three common examples of unallowable costs. Uh, this is really brief, but I just wanted to show you this because this is something that does come up uh, quite frequently. The first, classroom materials for students uh, to use are not an allowable expense, not under Title II Part A which that's for the same reason that we just kind of hit on. You can look at coordination of funds here and you can use uh, some federal funding for classroom materials, but just, just not that Title II Part A. Title II Part A funds may not be used for rental of a venue to provide professional learning unless that expense is determined to be a necessary and reasonable expense. So you can use your Title II funding for PD purposes, but not to rent out, say, you know, like your, your local civic center, unless you can show that that expense is necessary and reasonable. And then the last piece here, Title II Part A funds may not be used to purchase food or beverages. Any questions for me before we transition uh, and a little bit more into the program funding side of things um, and then local usage of funds? Were there any allowable or unallowable questions that you had that we did not address in the examples that we just looked at? We just have a question in regards to travel and whether or not I can use travel funding, uh, whether, or not, whether or not I can use my Title II Part A travel funding um, to pay for travel, sorry. And that is a tricky thing. You can, but I would like to send you uh, specifically where it says the statute. I, I want to send you exactly what it says. Let me say it that way. Um, but it's, it's, again, kind of like a fine line piece because it has to be able to tie back directly to the intent and purpose of the grant. And with this Title II Part A, it's uh, for the retention and recruitment um, of our educators as well as our principals and paraprofessionals. So, I am making a note to myself now to make sure that I send you the direct wording for it um, because that's one of those things that you, you want to be careful with. It's not that you can't, but you want to be careful with it. Any other questions? Okay, if you have any, feel free to type them in our chat, and if not, feel free to email them to either Becky or I, and we will reply to you as soon as possible. So let's go into local usage of funds. Now, of uh, course, in statute, there is a whole section on <laughs> uh, state usage of funds, but I wanted to show you um, the part out of legislation that's specific to the LEA. So I'm not gonna read all this to you again, but I just wanted to make sure that you knew where to find it and what the intent of, of 
using this funding source would be. So uh, one of the things that points out here to me under, and just as a side note as well, I'm getting ready to show you 10. There are 10 distinct things that are found uh, in, and this comes directly out of statute. I literally copied and pasted it onto the slides because I wanted to, to be able to show you how it all links together and how these 10 pieces show themselves or illustrate themselves in our actual consolidated application that we had to fill out in the state of Texas. So these next 10, if you were to look at your ESSA, uh, oh, I'm sorry, not your ESSA, your Nickelby consolidated application and e-grants, what you will see is this was listed last year under the 3104, your program schedule 3104, um, specifically says Title II Part A, TPTR, Teacher Principal Retention. We have six things listed there. <laughs> we have six that are listed with the option of number seven being an other, wherein you could type in a few things. So be aware that some of this stuff kind of um, in the in the statute is spread out, but in Texas, in our consolidated application, it's condensed to six things. So this first thing here basically is talking about recruiting and retaining teachers and principals. The second piece goes into implementing initiatives to recruit and retain uh, teachers. And, and it says here, part B, also highly qualified teachers to reduce class size, particularly in the early grades. Section three talks about professional development activities. Number four talks about um, retention of, it does say highly qualified because it's nickel B, but retention of state certified teachers and principals, particularly with elementary schools. And it goes into mentoring, induction, incentives, and those incentives can also include stipends uh, and then other financial incentives there is, is D. Number five, carrying out programs and activities that are designed to improve the quality of the teacher force. So again, this goes into PD and it does point out it's, it's once something that's innovative, not, you know, this is what we've always done kind of thing. Uh, development of use of cost effective strategies, merit pay, six, seven, eight. And I do, I'm aware that it's skipping number nine, but I promise you when I show you where this is in the, in the statute, you're like, what happened to number nine? It's not there either. It goes six, seven, eight, and then 10. Uh, carrying out PD activities, again, to improve the quality, hiring state certified and, and what they have here, highly qualified teachers uh, who can become highly qualified through state and local routes, uh, carrying out teacher advancement initiatives, which again is back to PD, and then carrying out programs and activities related to exemplary teachers. If you look at the consolidated uh, application under Nickleby, all of those are just condensed to, number one, recruitment, hiring, and retention of highly qualified teachers, assistant principals, and pupil services personnel. Two, the improvement of the quality of the teacher workforce. Three, class size reduction. Four, improvement of the quality of the paraprofessional workforce. Five, professional development in core academic subject areas. And then six, Title II Part A funds consolidated in one or more Title II Part A school-wide campus budgets to upgrade the entire uh, educational program at the campus. So all, we're really nine, I'm not sure what they did with number nine, but all of those pieces that are there in the statute and our e-grants application system boils down to six things. Any questions on that? Because I want to briefly go into recruitment and how you can use the funding uh, your Title II Part A funding for recruitment. But in short, all of these pieces boil down to, um, in your, your nickel B consolidated application, what's considered just your Part Three plan expenditures, but so six things really. Cool beans. Just as another reminder, Title II funding, so there is a supplement, not supplant clause, of funds received under this shall be used to supplement and not supplant non-federal funds that would otherwise be used for activities authorized under this subpart. So one quick slide on recruitment. You can utilize Title II Part A funds to pay for recruitment expenses and other recruitment stipends to your educators, your teachers and principals. Uh, these can be new hires or district transfers and these teachers must be assigned to teach what's here under Nickleby core academic subjects, which we know under ESSA will be a well-rounded education. If there exists a documented shortage of your state 
certified teachers within a school or LEA. Uh, teachers and principals may receive recruitment stipends in order uh, for students to have equitable access to uh, st state certified experience and effective teachers. And then lastly, if you plan to pay recruitment stipends, there must be a corresponding strategy with action step in your CIP or your, or your DIP. So under the statute, and, and a lot of districts do this, we do offer uh, supplemental uh, stipend pay, or if you sign with us and you are a special education teacher or a physics teacher, we do have, you know, in essence, like a signing bonus, like a, a, a supplemental, an additional stipend. It's not a problem if you do that. You just want to make sure that you have it listed and it corresponds with your CNA because you've identified your need in that CNA that we need this particular type of educator to assist with the academic achievement. You've identified it in your CIP, say in one of those strategies that we want to offer this uh, as a recruitment strategy. And then in turn, uh, the program evaluation side of this, which you would be in now, uh, this is the reason why we did this. So at this stage, I want us to look a little deeper into the program evaluation process. Do you have, and I know I keep asking you this, but I like to, to check as we go to make sure there aren't any other questions about anything that we've covered at this point, because from here going forward, we're gonna go into the program evaluation process, which is a general process that we use for all of the fund, federal uh, funding um, sources that we have, and then we'll start to go into a CNA, CIP, and then a closing. A question that I did not address earlier that I want to make sure I hit on. It is in regards to using Title II funding for all day PD. You, you can, you can use Title II funding for that, but again, you want to go back and have a look and, and make sure that that PD that you're offering is something that benefits everyone that you have in that PD training. So, for example, if the PD that I'm paying for out of my Title II funding is uh, let's see, specific to say, also, and even then it can be a little tricky because if I say I'm bringing someone in specifically for math and reading, um, and I'm paying for it out of that, what all of my educators that are involved in that program uh, benefit for all of the educators on the campus benefit from that. And in essence, math and reading is not just taught by the math and reading teachers. So yeah, you could have everyone in there. Excuse me, I'm thinking out loud as, as I answer your question. Um, Yes, you can use that Title II funding to pay for an all-day PD, but keep in mind it also does not include food. It doesn't include beverages. If you, I guess I would want to know a little bit more uh, as to what it is that you're trying to pay for with that Title II funding. Um, if, if it's for, say, like a conference, if it's for someone um, coming into work directly with your staff, that's something that I would like to, to know a little bit, a little bit more of the details as to what specifically you're paying for with that all day PD, if that makes sense. So yes, you can pay for PD out of your Title II, your Part A, it's, it's in the statute, you can, um, but that's one of those things that you want to look at all the pieces of it to make sure that what you're paying for meets and hits that actual uh, test of is this something that's reasonable, you know, and necessary. So long answer short, as I was thinking out loud as I was responding to you, you can pay for it, but I, I would like to know a little bit more details um, before I just say, yes, everything can be paid, all day PDs can be paid for out of your Title II Part A. Uh, you wanna make sure that what you're paying for does support the intent and purpose of the grant. All right, let's go into the program evaluation process. So if you have a copy of the booklet itself, which can be found on our region10.org website slash title one, or the TA's website as well, uh, the program evaluation process is spelled out on page six. It looks a little different from this because we're gonna tackle these kind of one piece at a time, um, but this is found on page six of the entire booklet, and it's broken down into these five pieces. The first of which is listing your needs. 
Second, identifying the strategies. Third, identifying your funds. Fourth, reviewing your data. And then fifth, evaluating the actual impact of the program. So step one are of this five-step process for the program evaluation says to list the needs identified within your CNA, your comprehensive needs assessment. So I have a snapshot or screenshot of one of the eight areas uh, in the CNA, and this one specifically is student achievement. And you'll see there it has your potential data sources. Um, in this case, they use graduation, completion, dropout. They also use student work samples and state assessment data. And then there at the bottom, you see data sources reviewed. And those data sources can come from a variety of places, of course. It could be your CNA, your uh, CIP, your DIP. It could be uh, trend data. It can be um, parent involvement survey information. The, the data should, it could, and it should come from a variety of sources. Qualitative data as well is also uh, used with your data sources where you're reviewing it. You just want to make sure, again, um, that you have a variety of data from multiple sources. This is page two of your CNA, and specifically the student achievement, even though the template is the same for all of the eight areas. This is where you list your strengths and then your needs. And then the summary of the needs at the bottom is listed in order of the, uh, your highest priority. So one thing I wanna point out from this as well, we highly encourage our partners to list more than one or two needs. Uh, and the reason why we say that is because, let, let's say you randomly get additional funding. Let's say the district reallocates, um, all of a sudden we have more funding uh, from the state than what they even realized. We got more than we thought we were gonna get. Well, you now want to implement this new program. Well, since it all starts and is grounded in that CNA, if it's not listed as an actual need in that CNA, you technically would have to go back and re-engage in the entire CNA process again, because anytime you're using funding, be it federal or state or, or, or local, you want to be able to show how it came directly from that CNA. So sometimes we get um, CNAs and CIPs, especially for campuses and districts that are wanting to transition a campus into Title I school-wide, and we're looking through their information, and they may only have one or two needs per area, and we highly suggest that you list a few more. Um, even if you're thinking, you know what, there's no way we'll get through all three of these this year. List them anyway, because you never know what opportunity you may have later, maybe through a community partner. You never know what opportunity you may have later to actually address that need. And we want to, we have to be able to show how it was, this is a need that was, that was uh, through research, through data, identified as something that we, we need to address for our specific student population. Here is the second step, identifying the strategies. So using our district and or our campus improvement plans, we want to identify the strategies or initiatives that address the programs and needs that were connected to this specific federal program. So what I have here is a snapshot of just a generic or general uh, CIP template Here's another page in it, this is page five of it. And what you'll see there, uh, the ideal state, your goal, the objective. But here, where it lists the strategies and action steps, this is the actual strategy that they're referring to. And this strategy, this entire line, is a direct reference to that CNA, which why, again, it is very important that that CNA is, is pretty solid. Uh, you want to put time into development of that CNA because it all links back to that the strategies and action steps, this is a strategy that we are identifying based on the need that we saw in our CNA data. So in this instance, we're referencing Title II Part A, which is the, uh, the teacher and principal training and recruiting, you know, retention kind of thing. I wanna be able to say, well, based on this data found in our CNA, this is why we are implementing this strategy, and this directly ties to our Title II Part A because of XYZ. So there you also have next to it person responsible and then the resources. Excuse me one moment guys. I'm sorry. <laughs> Get ready to cough a little bit over here. Give me one second. I'm 
my apologies. So the resources that you see there, that's referencing all funding that you may be getting. It's, it's funding, again, that could be federally uh, allocated, state or local. Resources is just really your money, how much money you think, and it's not totally money, but you wanna include money there, how much funding you think it will take in order to uh, actually enact uh, that strategy or action step. Then you have your timelines, evidence of implementation, evidence of impact, formative and summative evaluation opportunities, and then what was considered your Title I uh, 10 school-wide components. So this is here, um, and your strategies that you list on that improvement plan, be it district or campus, should come directly from that CNA. And as a side note as well, because we, we do get questions that regards to that Title I, uh, 10 school-wide components, it is no longer listed as the 10 school-wide components in ESSA. However, that does not mean that all of those pieces went away. Uh, in fact, there are more than 10 now, and <laughs> we are trying to come up with a, uh, a way of being able to digest the requirements that are listed in there now. Uh, they're not going to be called 10 school-wide components anymore because the legislation does not call it that, and there are, in fact, more than 10. Um, so if you have that Title I school-wide or 10 school-wide components in your CIP, um, I wouldn't necessarily get rid of the column, but just know that it's no longer going to be called your Title I uh, 10 school-wide components. It will be called something else, and we're still finding a nice way to package it all uh, for our districts that we serve here in the Region 10 area. Um, but I wouldn't necessarily get rid of that column because something will go there. It's just not called that. In addition, going into the 17-18 school year, the TEA has four strategic priorities, or just strategic priorities would be another way, I guess, if you were going to create a column for it, that you could call it. Uh, and the commissioner has been talking about it about the last year and a half now, but it's finalized, it is out there, and if you are looking at revamping or firming up your improvement plans, uh, that would be something, I, if it were me, that I would uh, definitely add, because you definitely want to be able to show um, how whatever strategy or action that you have in those improvement plans are, is directly aligning and supporting with the commissioner, the TEA's uh, strategic priorities that we have going into this 17-18 school year, just as an FYI. And since recruit and retention, recruiting, retaining, and uh, training uh, are teaching and um, principles is part of the commissioner's priorities, which that's actually priority uh, number one. Uh, that would be something that I would add to it because it directly links to our Title II, in this case, um, with the recruiting, retention, uh, and training of our professionals. So step three in the five-step process, identify the amount of funds expended to implement the strategy or initiative if applicable. So this goes back to, and I screenshot in here, just a column of these um, CIP or DIP district recruitment plan. This one, when I mentioned earlier, the resources, this is where the money goes. This is where you would put the money. So you would, you should be able to go back and look at your improvement plan and say, hey, this is how much we uh, actually anticipated this program costing at the beginning of this process. And now on the end of it here at the program evaluation phase of it, this is how much we anticipated and this is how much it actually cost actual funding, you want to pull your budget reports for this. This is not a budget report from a, a district within our region, uh, but I did pull this from the TEA's website. Um, this is just a district in, in another region, but this is just a, a screenshot of their budget reports. So you'll see here, when we're looking at, this is the end of the year, I'm evaluating this program, how much did I spend in this program, and what exactly was spent uh, uh, using this funding. So program expenditures on step three when we're looking at the funding, definitely pull out your budget reports. Um, and again, look at what we anticipated or uh, expected this program to cost, but then turn around also and look at how much did it actually cost us. Step four goes into reviewing your data. So once again, we're looking back at that CNA at, at a minimum, we're looking at that CNA, we're looking at our improvement plans, be it district or campus. We also wanna look at student achievement and then the budget reports. 
but with reviewing the data, we want to make sure that the data identifies and measures the fidelity of the implementation and impact of that strategy or initiative. So did our student outcomes change? Did they improve? Did student achievement increase? This again is just another screenshot of uh, one of our areas for the CNA. I also included, included a snapshot from, um, this is a uh, older workshop that I wrote and used to facilitate here at 10. This one I think I did about three years ago. Uh, it was a reteaching session. And this is just a snapshot of fake data. As you can see, we have a Mad Hatter in here as a student and uh, Ariel Mermaid and Yosemite Sam. Um, but the reason why I screenshot this in here, it's just a reminder again, use additional data sources. Uh, it can be your trend data. You want to be able to show, especially with Title II Part A funding, we're, we're talking about whether or not the resources invested into our teachers, into our paraprofessionals, into our principals, directly impacted overall student achievement? If so, we should be able to see that reflected in our data. So additional data sources can also include even like your sign-in sheets. If I'm saying I'm paying for uh, a professional development opportunity for these XYZ teachers, I can use my sign-in sheets as, as proof or, or uh, another supporting uh, evidence of implementation that this did actually occur. I said I was going to do this, and this sign-in sheets uh, show that this actually occurred. You can even use results of surveys. If you went back and surveyed your, or if you did kind of a pre-assessment, post-assessment um, kind of thing with your, your teachers and peer professionals or principal, your leadership, um, versus when they, before they went and experienced whatever that PD was and engaged in and where they are now that they've experienced it and where they are, you know, six, seven weeks from now, are they still continuing the process and what they learned um, by us paying for them to have that opportunity to engage in that. If you have meeting minutes, you can feel free to use those as well. So here is the last step in the actual program evaluation process. And this is evaluating the impact. So with our federal funding, and all funding, but with this, we want to make sure that when we're evaluating the program, that we're looking at the impact. After we're looking, looking through data and finding out the impact of it, I, at that point, need to feel comfortable in making recommendations for either continuing this program, this strategy, this action, or modifying it. And if I need to modify it, I need to modify it. It's not saying that the program, per se, um, wasn't successful. It just maybe wasn't as successful as what we would have liked it to be based on the data that we have to support this. So when you're looking at the program evaluation tool, which is just an Excel sheet, and I'll show you how to access it if you don't already have it on our Region 10 website or region10.org slash title one, uh, there's that column that says, you know, recommendation. So it's all based on did this program, this initiative, this action that we invested this federal funding or state funding, local funding, whatever, into be successful or cause an outcome for our students that's positive enough for us to continue this. So what I have here is just a screenshot of a, a heat map. It's nothing special uh, about this particular one. It's just another way of looking at it because sometimes we can become uh, a little close to the data. And looking at it globally like this, I think sometimes helps us in being able to see, we thought this was a really cool program. We thought this was a really cool strategy or initiative, but based on this data, this does not have the anticipated outcome uh, for our students. Uh, so maybe we need to look at this again. Was the impact enough to, con to warrant continuing this? So now I want to transition into the program evaluation tool. And this is just a couple of slides. And at the very end of this, I'll show you how to access this um, as well. So this particular one is the Title II Part A Teacher Training and Recruiting. You see entitlement there at the top of the screen. And this is, you know, how much money? This is how much money was allocated or you received for this funding. Completion date, I want to remind us that that's not the date, the end of the school year kind of completion date. This is the completion date, the end of the evaluation of the program. So program intent, this just, we've already covered this, but funds provide supplemental funding to improve student achievement, 
goes into the detailed definition of it um, and the intent of why this federal funding is provided. Bottom left-hand side of the form, this is page one, has both the name and the position. The reason why this is starred is because I wanted to make sure that I, I remind you the name that's there, we want to have full names, um, try to stay away from, you know, abbreviations. Um, and we also want to make sure that we are listing the position of that person. Uh, and what that means is within the CNA process, you have a minimum of eight members. However, you can have 20 if you choose to. Um, but when evaluating it, what is the role that that person plays? Are they part of the leadership team? Are they an administrator? Are they a, an educator on the campus? Uh, is it a parent? Uh, is it a student? Uh, is it a pupil services personnel, i.e. a counselor? Part of the reason why we want all this information there is because it shows a well-rounded, a committee of people who have vested interests in the program, but also come at it from different perspectives. So it's not, I don't want to say jaded, by in, or probably influence would be a better way of, of saying it, by one perspective. It's not all teachers who are part of the program evaluation committee. It's not only the administrators. This is page two of the program evaluation tool. You'll see here on the far left column, it's date. And then the second is identified needs from the CNA. Uh, because as I said earlier, you're not getting away from that CNA. So this is basically, I have my CNA here. I'm looking at uh, on this particular date and the date that's listed here, it's not necessarily gonna be the same date going down the form. This is the date that we actually looked at that specific uh, need from the CNA and that specific strategy. So it's the date, identified needs, the strategy that we selected to address this need. So this is, you know, of course our CIP at this point, and the expenditure. How much did we anticipate us spending on this strategy or action? Um, and that comes again from our CIP in our budget reports. The next column you see there, the impact. That's the evidence of impact category. So when we looked at this, that was uh, step number five in the five-step program evaluation process. But what was the actual impact of us, or due to us investing resources into this strategy um, to address the need that was identified in the CMA? So that recommendations column is very important. Again, it's not saying that this wasn't if, you, if the data that comes from this, if we do a, an actual data analysis, and we're looking at the data and it says, you know, there wasn't a significant enough increase in student achievement or student performance to warrant uh, using or investing in this particular strategy for next year. It's, again, not saying that it's bad that we try to, or that we engaged in that process this year. It's just the recommendation could be, you know what, this is something that, Fine, but we aren't getting a big enough bang for our buck for us to continue this into the next uh, school year. And then at the bottom there, you see data sources again, because again, it's important that we are using uh, diverse and multi, uh, multiple uh, sources of data so that it's not all coming from student achievement scores um, like your local benchmarks, or it's not all just perception data. So I will show you, I know I said this before, but I will show you where to access this evaluation tool. It's an editable document and it's a Microsoft Excel sheet. So at this stage, we're going to go into the CNA and CIP link very briefly. And then we will also uh, start heading into uh, resources and then our closing. Do you have any questions about the program evaluation process or the tool itself? Okay, let's keep going. With the CNA and CIP, how does this all tie together and what does it have to do with program evaluation? Well, the comprehensive needs assessment is required and this is a copy of the booklet uh, that can be found on our region10.org slash title one site. I'll take you to it at the end of this, um, which really does walk you through the entire process of how to conduct a CNA and it even provides some probing questions for you if you're stuck and like, I'm not quite sure how to get this, the conversation started. 
uh, it does offer that for you in the booklet. So here is the next piece, which is do I actually have to do this? Federally, because sometimes there is this misconception that I only have to do the CNA because it's in our federal legis, it's because of those title programs. That's not the case. We do, it is required both at the federal level as well as the state level. Um, it's noted in our Elementary and Secondary Education Act, which you know was signed back in 1965 by President Johnson. Um, it's also seen again in our No Child Left Behind, of course, the requirement for it uh, in Title I Part A and then other Nickel B programs like your Title II. Uh, this is also found in the Texas Education Codes as well, um, that we have to conduct an actual CNA, that we're not randomly spending funding without a rhyme or reason or rationale as to why we are doing so. The purpose of the CNA, again, is to look at multiple sources of data to identify and prioritize the needs in direction for the school or, or district. The needs assessment guides the development of a comprehensive school-wide plan and also suggests benchmarks for its evaluation because it all goes uh, together from that CNA. It's just a continuum from the CNA to the CIP to the program evaluation component. And it, this is very closely linked. It should be closely linked to all aspects of your school-wide um, and even targeted or just program implementation in general. So I mentioned to you before that there are the minimum of the eight CNA members. Um, just as an FYI, if you want to participate in a full training of what used to be called your school support team training, which we have uh, revamped and rebranded and added new activities and it now complies um, with new ESSA requirements, we are offering that several times throughout the year here at Region 10. Uh, the very next one is actually on June 5th and June 6th. And then we're offering it also in September, the 27th and the 28th, and then into January and April. Uh, if you're a member of the SSA, this is something that we can set up free of charge. The fee would be waived for you at alternate times. If you're not a member of our SSA, uh, we can come out and facilitate the trainings other than the four times I just noted, uh, but there would be a nominal fee involved in that. So the CNA members that we have listed there on the left-hand side, comprised of community members, or business members, uh, parents, principals, pupil services personnel, school staff, students at the secondary level as applicable, but they are required, uh, teachers, and then technical assistance providers. Within the CNA, there are eight areas and committees, and those are the eight that you see there on the right-hand side of the screen. Uh, demographics, student achievement, school culture and climate, staff quality, recruitment, and retention, curriculum instruction and assessment, family and community involvement, school context and organization, as well as technology. So I wanna point out, because sometimes we get asked, uh, can I have the same exact people on each one of these committees because our campus is small, uh, our district is an intimate size, uh, you know, I, I don't have 64 people sitting around that I can use uh, over and over again, theoretically with eight different committees and a minimum of eight members, I would have 64. The answer to that is, is you can use uh, multiple people. Uh, for example, like your principal, if you're a, a smaller campus, would probably sit on each one of these committees. Um, however, we want to try as hard as possible as of not having these same eight people on all eight committees for a variety of reasons, one of which it limits, pers limits perspective. Um, another uh, reason behind that too is to avoid burnout. Um, from those who are part of the committees because we want them to be truly vested in it. And then another one, just more practical, not everybody is strong in each of these. Um, one, of our, one of our colleagues here, uh, she's one of our counseling consultants, she would be fantastic at school culture and climate, um, whereas I probably would be a better person to fall under the curriculum instruction and assessment side of the committee. <laughs> so just looking at the actual needs of uh, especially those that are identified within that CNA committee itself, that's when you wanna start looking around saying, hey, who would be a good fit for this particular uh, committee? Because it's, it's not always gonna be the same exact people. We just had a question in regards to the CNA committee and your site-based decision-making committee. Uh, the question was, can we use that same people on both? And the answer to that would be, yeah. 
you can. You, you will see some similarities across the committees, especially for campuses and districts that are just a little uh, more intimate in size. Um, I would say, again, just as a side note, try not to have the exact same people because there's a different context and different purpose uh, based on what the committee is for. But yes, if you want to use some of the same people from your SVDM on your CNA committees, totally makes sense because there is some continuity as far as the members and the requirements. Thank you for that question. So wrapping up our CNA, here is a screenshot, and we're not completely wrapping up yet, but I do, I do have a couple more slides. Um, but here's a screenshot of the CNA form. This one is just a general one. This comes from the Student Achievement. All of the forms look the same. They're just slightly different uh, depending on which of the eight areas you're addressing at the time. But you see that at the very top, student achievement data refers to the annual and longitudinal overviews from various sources of formal and informal data. So it starts off with this is the area, this is the intent of this area, kind of a descriptor. Then it goes into your possible data sources. The data sources reviewed, again, which we've talked about quite a bit, so I feel comfortable with that. Uh, the findings and analysis, so we're looking at the strengths, and then again, opportunities for growth, opportunities for improvement, which is where we directly pull our summary of needs, our prioritizing the needs that we have. Since your CNA is based on that year and projecting what we're using for the next year, that CNA is a flexible breathing document that may change throughout the year. So when I conduct my next CNA uh, in preparation for this upcoming school year, if all of a sudden my demographics change or I have a, a mass influx of a different um, demographic of student, then yeah, I, I can and should go back in and have a look at the CNA again. So I have this little graphic here just as a reminder again that that CNA is central. It is the foundation, it is the base of everything that we do um, due to the data because of the data found in that CNA that directly informs our plan of action, the strategies that we're gonna use, which is that CIP or DIP at the district level. And because of what we found, the needs and areas for opportunity for growth that we found in that CNA, it informs what I'm using my title funding for. It informs what I'm using my state allotment funding for. So that CNA is that, that base, that foundation of everything that we're going to do and we're going to attempt to do during this upcoming school year. The CNA gives us the needs. Now, once we have that CNA, we turn around and use that data to then inform our action or our plan, which is our CIP right, or your DIP, either way, that improvement plan drives our actual funding. So what I mean by that is that CNA, again, think of it, thinking of it as a continuum, that CNA is the first step. It lets us know what the needs are. Because of the needs, we now are developing a plan to address those needs. In that plan, I have to pay for it. I'm paying for these strategies or activities that we've identified that would be awesome to address the needs that we found in the CNA. So that CIP, if it's not there, I'm not spending the funding on it. That CIP is the, the roadmap to how I'm spending my funding for this upcoming school year, be it federal, local, or state. So to kind of tie this all together, the needs assessment determines the why, right? It, it, it gives us, based on data, why this is happening, and it exists by conducting a root cause analysis. Our improvement plan is the action. It's the what I am now going to do to address the needs that I identified in that CNA. The program evaluation component is, I was told, I identified these were the needs, my plan was my action, this is what we're gonna to do to address it. Did it actually work? Did we actually address what we said we were going to address? Was the outcome beneficial for our students? And was it worth continuing, worthy of us continuing this, this upcoming school year? That's how it all kind of meshes and gilds together. <laughs> okay? Do you have any questions for me on this before I start going into uh, kind of closing and resources?
All right. Not to kind of beat a dead horse, but one last time, that CNA is the foundation and the basis for our improvement plans. It's the resources, it's the budgetary allocations, the actions and strategies for actual improvement. And using that data that we gathered from the CNA during that process informs our academic, our students, our family, staff, community plans, our, our plans of action that we're going to engage in. And then that program evaluation just measures, did we do what we said we were going to do? Was it the biggest bang for our buck by doing this? Were the student outcomes beneficial? So going into uh, the program, other program evaluation series webinars that we have coming up, uh, tomorrow will be the last one for this week, and it is covering our Title III Part A, uh, English Language Acquisition, Language Enhancement, and Academic Achievement Act. And then uh, we'll start back up for our last three remaining after tomorrow on Monday, and that'll be Title III Part A Immigrant. Title IV Part A Safe and Drug-Free Schools will be on the 31st. And then we'll culminate on June 1st with the Title VI Part B Rural Education Initiative. And just as a side note, these titles are totally different. <laughs> it changes under uh, ESSA. So I'm aware that Title VI is no longer that. It's rural education is not that anymore. Um, it's just since we are closing out our time in Nickel B, I wanted to make sure that we provided the evaluation um, series based on what we are currently under, which is still no child left behind. So I want to show you a couple of resources on our Title I site, and I'll take you there in a moment. Uh, you will see uh, all of the resources that I've been referencing throughout. And that's region10.org slash Title I. And as soon as you go on the site, you'll see the overview there. Uh, Title I Part A specifically has the uh, program evaluation piece that we've been looking at. Uh, there's, as you scroll down the screen itself, uh, you'll see the CNA components on the left-hand side of it, and it has, as I mentioned before, like those probing questions. We're wanting to get into this, but we're kind of slightly stuck, so how do we begin the, the dialogue, the discourse? Uh, then it goes into the needs assessment tool. Um, the campus improvement plan is there as well, so a checklist and your requirements. And then the evaluation piece, which is what we've covered today. That first one is the booklet, and the second one is the tool, which is the Excel sheet. So I am going to go to the site now to show you where you can access it, what it looks like. So this again is on our region10.org slash title one site. So give me one moment to pull that up. And let me switch screens. Oh, already did it. Aha, I'm ahead of myself. Okay, so title one part A, I've just showed you this. This is this the site itself. As a side note, if uh, we do have a brand new cooperative that we're starting, uh, Becky Book is taking the lead on it. So if you have any questions about the state allotments co-op, uh, Becky can answer all of those for you. They are brand new for this year, for the 17-18 school year. If you have any questions and want to find out a little bit more about what's considered um, and what's going to be covered in this cooperative, uh, please reach out to Becky. She has all of that information for you. Up here on the right are the upcoming events. And as you can see, I am pretty much taking over a lot of the section of upcoming because we wanted to make sure that we provided this series for you all uh, during this time where you are uh, starting to evaluate programs. We have past webinars here. And if you wanna see some of the ones that we've already covered under this program evaluation series, they're here. As soon as uh, we finish recording, I upload them into our technology department's kind of inbox and then they put them on our YouTube channel, and then I, in turn, I'll put them here on the website so you can see any, any of the past ones that we've already covered. This says Nickel B application compliance. As of July 1, that will no longer say Nickel B. It'll go into um, specifically for ESSA. Title I Part A is what I was just talking about or just showing you um, on our uh, PowerPoint, but here is the CNA piece here. Here's the upcoming CNA CIP, which was formerly our school support training for campuses that were wanting to go Title I school-wide. These are the four dates that I mentioned uh, that are coming up these year, this year and are complimentary to all. If you are a member of the SSA, we also have additional dates uh, that are included as, uh, for members that are part of our SSA that are not published here. 
this is the CNA probing questions uh, booklet that I took. Well, it's the entire booklet, but it also shows probing questions. I am trying not to scroll too quickly because I do not want to make you dizzy, uh, but probing questions starts here on page eight. It says seven here, but it's our virtual page eight. And you can ask all of these questions if you want. Some of them are 12, 10. Uh, there's a couple, I think, that are 11 questions. Or you can ask the ones that you think are, are most specific to your campus, to your district, which would help the conversation start. Here's the CNA tool, which is an Excel document and uh, looks exactly like what I just showed you. Let me share this other screen with you. Give me one moment because it opened in a different area for me. So let me enable the editing so you can have a look at that. But this is the screenshot of what I've been showing you throughout when I was referencing that CNA. So student achievement, demographics, staff quality, uh, school context, all of this is here. And this you can type directly into it. It's an editable document. Okay, let me come out of that. I do not need to save it. Uh, so now let me share my other screen once again. One moment as I flip between screens. Okay. Going back to our Title I site. Down here is the CIP information, as well as the program evaluation series. Uh, this is what you are engaging in now, but if you want to forward the flyer on to others or colleagues, feel free to do so. This is the program evaluation booklet, which you've seen a screenshot of this a few times during our time together as well. If you have not already seen it, it is here. It goes into a little bit uh, more information, but all of the information that we've already covered are during our time together. And this is the uh, five-step process that I mentioned to you earlier that we have already gone through. Last piece here, the program evaluation tool. As I said before, this is an Excel document. Bear with me as we switch screens one more time. <laughs> well, two more times after this. I'm gonna enable editing so that you can see that this is a document that you can type directly into. The funding, title funding sources are down here at the bottom, as well as the option of the local uh, and then the state comp A. So we are in Title II Part A. So this is the form that I've already shown. This is what we looked at. You can type directly into it. It is totally at your discretion what you want to put in here. Again, the completion date is the date that the, the program evaluation itself was completed. Not the end of the school year, not when the program ended, if the program ended prior or before the end of the school year, it's the completion date of the evaluation. This is the same information I showed you before. Uh, just make sure that uh, you include all of it in here and you want to maintain a copy of this um, locally. All right, so taking you one more time back to my other screen and and that should be it as far as the flipping of the back and forth of the screens, I promise you. Um, okay, let's go back to our PowerPoint. So, well, well, yeah, I think this is all we need to show from here. Um, going into the remaining pieces that I have, if you want to see some more information uh, directly from the TEA's website, as well as the full statute, that's on tea.texas.gov site, uh, specifically the Title II Part A, Teacher Training and Recruiting Component, uh, that definition that you see there is one that we already referenced throughout our time together. It has the statute, policy guidance, and then the highly qualified teacher requirements, which again, highly qualified, I think they still have that listed there as that because it is in the statute in, in the law, but we know that as of 16, 17, highly qualified, it's, it's not there anymore uh, for this year. It, it went to state certification for teachers, but how to qualify requirements for paraprofessionals. If you wanna look at the guidance document that's there on that page, uh, this is here also on the TA's website, and this is just guidance for actual implementation of it. Some of the questions that, you, uh, that I shared with you today are common questions that we get, and they're also found in this uh, guidance for implementation document that's on the TA's website. So at this phase, I just have uh, one last question for you. Do you have any questions and feedback information for me before I show you our contact information? OK. 
thank you again for joining me today and thank you for bearing with my uh, somewhat congested sounding voice. <laughs> Here is our contact information. Amber Lazane is our Assistant Director over Special Revenue Services. Tony Garrett, you see next to her on the right, she is a program coordinator for a statewide Title I capacity building initiative. Becky Book is my colleague here at State Allotments. Uh, she is the consultant for that, as well as ESSA SSA. I'm there in the middle, Lauren McKinney, also one of your consultants serving here with the ESSA SSA. And then we have Laura Griffin there on the right. She is a consultant that works exclusively with our private nonprofits. If you have any questions for us, please do not hesitate to reach out to us. In that top right-hand corner, you'll see our special revenue services booklet that was for the 17, uh, for the upcoming 17-18 school year. It does list some of the services that we provide on our team. And as I go into closing, if you did not have the opportunity to register in our calendar of events, please feel free to do so there. Uh, just as another record that you participated in this today, um, the attendance uh, so you, you will self-identify for attendance is listed there as well. And just as a reminder, it is gg.gg slash looks like pest, P-E-S-T number two P-A. It's supposed to stand for a Program Evaluation Series Title II Part A. With that, this is the end of our time together today. Uh, if you have any remaining questions whatsoever, please feel free to reach out to us so that we may be of continued service to you here at the Region 10. Thank you so much for your time, and we hope that you have a fantastic remainder of your day.